Happy New Year, everyone. Wishing you a peaceful, healthy, and prosperous 2021. I'm Yelena Surilov, the Associate Director of International Engagements at the Office of Alumni Relations. On behalf of Narcissan University and myself, I hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy during this turbulent time. Welcome to our program on innovative solutions to fight ocean pollutions. I'd like to introduce to uh, you our speakers, Ben Knepris and uh, Martin Ikema van Dijk, uh, both graduates from College of Engineering. Ben has received his Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering in 2007, and Master, uh, Martin is double husky with Bachelors in 2014 and Masters in 2015 in Structural Engineering. Martin also received a certificate from Narcissan Gordon Institute of Engineering Leadership. Um, let me start with Ben. Ben is our social uh, entrepreneur focused on creating regenerative solutions that drive circular economy, specializing in life cycle assessment and corporate environmental and social responsibility. Uh, ben has spent the past seven years building Bureo, an emerging B Corp, creating net positive end of life cycling solutions for discarded uh, fishing nets. After graduating from Narcissan and a couple of years of traveling, Ben went to go, to go get his master's at Blekinge Institute of Technology, I'm sorry, in Sweden in strategic leadership uh, towards sustainability. Now back to Martin. Martin is our global leader and currently is working as an operations manager at Van Dijk Recycling Solutions, a family company specializing in design, sale, sales and service innovative recycling equipment. Uh, the company works with recyclers and waste uh, processors across North America to maximize efficiency and profit. Martin is an avid sailor, outdoor sport enthusiast and registered yoga teacher. Before we proceed to our program, I would like to go to uh, over a few housekeeping items. Please keep your microphones on mute and video off during the program. Uh, I would like to stress that um, you can ask your questions uh, in the Q&A sections in the bottom of your screen. You can also uh, raise your hand, um, use your uh, raise your hand function if you would like to ask your question in person. I also recommend that you put your uh, viewing Zoom on a speaker's view. Uh, there's a button on the right uh, top corner for you, on your screen to do that. So without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone to Martin. Martin? Thank you, Yelena. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so my name is Martin Inkema van Dijk. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar where Ben and I will be talking about the innovative ideas in recycling and cleaning up our oceans. <clears throat> Before I introduce Ben and his company, Boreo, I'll give a little background on myself. Uh, ben will then dive deeper into how he got to where he is today. Uh, and the innovative ideas Berea was working on to solve our ocean plastic pollution problem. Together, Ben and I will discuss those ideas and recycling solutions before opening it up to questions from the audience, uh, but feel free to ask them at any time. Through our individual networks, as well as our shared Northeastern University community, we reached out across the globe for this uh, to people in North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Oceania. I was asked to moderate this talk because of the industry I'm currently in, I'm the operations manager at Van Dyke Recycling Solutions, which is a family company, uh, and we specialize in the design, sales, and service of state-of-the-art recycling equipment. We work together with recyclers and waste processors across North America to maximize their efficiencies and profits, as Yelena mentioned. We're headquartered in Norwalk, Connecticut. However, the origins of our business and my family lay in the Netherlands. Before starting at Van Dyke, I worked in London for three years for a structural design team within Lang O'Rourke, the largest private construction firm in the UK. And I studied structural engineering at Northeastern, graduating with my bachelor's in 2014 and my master's in 2015, along with the certificate in engineering leadership from the Gordon Institute. I'm also a member of the Young Global Leaders Group at Northeastern. My time in co-ops at Northeastern allowed me to explore not just structural engineering, but also environmental, transportation, construction, and construction management. And I did that across the globe from Boston to New York to Mauritius in Africa, and even in my home country, the Netherlands. It's through our mutual connections at Northeastern that Ben and I were connected. Uh, and we discovered that we actually have similar backgrounds. Ben's father is also from the Netherlands and started his business in the US much the same way my father did. 
Ben has also traveled the world and used his global and co-op experiences to find his path in life and get to where he is today, which brings me to our topic of discussion. It's clear that the plastics pollution problem in our oceans is a worldwide issue as 18 billion pounds or 8 million metric tons of plastic end up in our oceans each day, each year, sorry. Uh, this plastic, this makes plastic one of the most common elements found in our ocean today. And it's estimated that in less than 30 years, ocean plastic will outweigh all of the ocean's fish. The long-term effects of plastic pollution are not even realized yet, as the plastic takes on average about 400 years to degrade and releases toxic chemicals as it does so. Not to mention the plastics break down into microplastics, which find our way, way into our own food chain. The marine mammals also often get trapped in or mistake large plastics for food, causing further harm to the environment. Ben has spent the past seven years building Bureo, an emerging B corporation, creating a net positive end of life recycling solution for these discarded fishing nets, which are one of the most harmful contributors to the ocean plastic problem. Originally from the south coast of Massachusetts, Ben graduated from Northeastern, which is Bachelor in Science and Mechanical Engineering in 2007. And then he went on to get his master's at the Blekingay Institute of Technology in Sweden in strategic leadership towards sustainability. Again, with much credit to his international co-op experiences in Northeastern, Ben lived and worked in over 10 countries across four continents and is now residing in Sao Paulo, Brazil with his wife and his two-year-old daughter. I'm just brushing the surface here with this intro and uh, Ben will do a much better job. So I'd like him to share his story. Great, thank you, Martin. Um, man, with, with all of those summaries, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, you guys did a better job than I will. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, to start there, I mean, I, I definitely wanna give a bit of background to highlight how much Northeastern played a critical role in my life um, that helped shape my experience and in, in, in the world, um, not only academically and, and what led to my professional career, but personally to, to find my passions and, and which brought me to where I'm at today with Boreo. Um, I grew up um, on the South Coast, just outside of Cape Cod in an um, area called Batapoisit, uh, Massachusetts. Um, went into Northeastern really just um, with an interest in um, science and math, having strong abilities in those areas. Um, and so thought engineering would be a fit, but really never saw myself as being much of an engineer. Um, and, and also as, as Martin mentioned with the father that came from the Netherlands, really got to live out the American dream where he always taught me um, the best job you, you're gonna do is, is the one you really love to do the most because it doesn't become a job anymore. It becomes your life's work and, and that, that's really where you can drive it with a passion. So coming into Northeastern, my, my whole idea was, okay, tap into this, these abilities I clearly have in, in math and science, um, but then use that co-op experience to, to find what I'm really passionate about. And so I really tried to take advantage of that um, in every, every co-op opportunity I had. I, I did my first one in Southern California for a biomedical company doing research and development. Um, then went on to uh, Galway, Ireland for my second one, got a really great taste of Europe being there. Um, and then my third one, I actually um, got the opportunity to work in a refugee settlement in Zambia. Uh, where I was part of a group of selected students from um, the Northeast of the United States um, through a program run by UNHCR um, to act as ambassadors for that settlement where we got to design, fundraise, and then go in and implement um, the community projects that we, we, um, we, we prepared. Uh, I actually rode a marathon on a rowing machine to raise money for it in the middle of your Northeastern University's campus. And, um, and was able to successfully implement um, a, on one, one area, a renewable energy program uh, where we installed solar panels and, and even had a, a bicycle set to, to teach kids about the, the power of electricity and the opportunities for generating it um, locally. And also a HIV AIDS education um, program for that where we combined the local soccer club to inspire the, the young youth about pre safe practices against HIV and AIDS. Um, what I really got out of that was um, 
that was hands down my biggest experience um, doing besides my my solid engineering degree I got out of Northeastern was um, unfortunately the, the the drawback of it was was what they call reverse culture shock when I got back to to the United States and you just run into this this feeling of of there's no justifiable reason why you find people like this and and I wanted answers. Um, some of the hard, most hardworking, generous, good-hearted people I've ever met were, were unfortunately um, had to flee their country due, due to civil war in most cases and, and ended up in this refugee settlement with, with at best one or two family members, a pot in a pan and a tent and, and that was about it. Um, and I wanted answers and, and so I got introduced then to the field of sustainability and it led, led me to the understandings of, of the systemic challenges the world's facing and the really the, the, the crisis we're, we're facing in terms of um, continuing to systematically drive, our, drive the world towards uh, an unsustainable future. We're just simply consuming and creating systemic uh, issues that are just driving us in the wrong direction and, and I was completely sold on, on that was what I really wanted to take on. Um, fortunately, I was introduced to this master's program in Sweden um, in strategic leadership towards sustainability where it was really about a multidisciplinary approach to apply this framework for strategic sustainable development to any defined system, um, community, um, product um, to achieve full sustainability in, in whatever defined area that may be. And I really embraced that and got into the field of life cycle assessment, which um, it was an area to combine uh, the hard numbers and, and, and um, the math and science I was getting from my engineering degree um, that would basically transform those numbers into actual values that could calculate things such as carbon footprint, water footprint, ecological footprint um, for any given product or service. Uh, I, I got the following with that connection, I, I got my first um, steps in my career as a sustainability consultant working in, in life cycle assessment where I worked in, um, in New Zealand, Australia, and then eventually led me to Chile, uh, where the, the national study I did in Australia, um, the Chilean government wanted to replicate. And so I came there with, with that intention. And what I actually discovered was um, this incredible country that was still um, as an ocean lover, still taken aback by how untouched it was. Many people say Chile is basically what Southern California is like uh, 50, 60 years ago. Beautiful untouched coastline still, um, very lo little development for such absolutely pristine areas. Um, but it is still modern day. And so the, the things that we were seeing on the ground was it was still completely um, impacted by the, the issues of plastic pollution, um, the industrial development that is uh, continuing to, to grow in those areas and, and the burden that it, it's being faced by, the consequences that's being faced by that. Um, simple things like eucalyptus um, plantations that were being put in a, a foreign tree that um, was consuming so much water in the area that local people couldn't even have clean drinking water. And, um, and so although there was this, this incredible conflict I was seeing of this beautiful place being burdened by these, these eventual systemic uh, unsustainable shifts that we're going through um, as, as, a, as a, every country is these days, um, I also saw a great opportunity and uh, the Chilean government had huge support systems specifically for entrepreneurs. Um, now, although my dad uh, came and started his own business in, in flower bulbs and, and my uncles in, in Holland as well got into that space, I really never saw myself necessarily being an entrepreneur. Um, but I don't know, there was something with, with that perfect combination of things in Chile. And I guess also continuing to work as a consultant where I wasn't seeing the change I was expecting to see by that point of just writing a report to have a meeting to write a report. Um, maybe I was getting too impatient, but, but with all those opportunities perfectly mixing and gelling and, and while I was in Chile, I, I relayed this to, to two of my really good friends um, that were, were, were really connected over any, more than anything surfing 
Um, I met in Australia uh, while living there for four and a half years and um, our, our appreciation for the ocean environment. Uh, one of them, David Stover, was, was well into his career as a financial consultant. And the other one, Kevin Ahern, was well into his career as a design engineer. And we just uh, would always have these offline discussions when we would go on surf trips about what if we could do something more meaningful? Like we're developing these skill sets. What if we could combine them more with our passions like, like I always dreamed of? And, and so when all that, that opportunity arose in Chile, um, there was the next, the next funding round for a specific program called, called Startup Chile, which anyone out there that's looking to start a, a, a new business it's really arguably one of the best offers you can find. It, it's um, you, you submit your business plan, your application, your CVs, and if you get accepted, you get from thirty to $100,000 in startup funds through the phases of the program. Um, visas to come and, and a commitment to come and live and work in Chile for at least six months to come and set up your business. And it's been an incredibly successful program. Um, we were generation eight, and I think they're now, in, gosh, like generation 40 or 50 by now. Um, but at, at that point in time, we saw the next application deadline was six months out, and we just put it on ourselves. Let's, let's just have a go. Let's use these six months, all of our free time, um, and this, this fascination we had uh, around plastic pollution to do something to take it on to, to protect the place we love, which was the ocean environment. Um, when we dug into it, um, there's so much research and we, we'll dive, we can dive deeper on this later with Martin, but um, the, the three main points we saw that were really tangible and solvable when it came to avoiding plastic pollution in our oceans is, is one, um, education. Still to this day, people don't know the consequences of, of discarding plastic pollution. Uh, it's pretty remarkable to think that something like a nylon fishing net being dropped in the ocean, something that's designed to trap and degrade marine life, can last over 500 years. Um, people don't really gather that that because it was just so suddenly there in their community and, and used. And, and just like they had everything else in their community, they would, could just discard it. And, but previously, that was a biodegradable material that would break down. But now nobody really taught them the consequences of discarding plastic. The second one is um, is infrastructure. Um, there's a the the lion's share of the plastic pollution, as you can imagine, it's pretty straightforward if you think about it, is from land-based sources. So if you actually look upstream and stop it at its source and have solutions for it by de designing it in the manner of a circular economy, um, where really nothing is waste, um, we we can prevent it from getting out in there in the first place because continually we were finding that the approach of getting it out there just is not effective. It's not realistic, it's not practical, and, and it's just not achievable. Um, so really stopping at the source was the consistent research we were finding. And the third one was behavior change. Um, the deeper intrinsic point was, if you can show there's value in a material, people won't discard it. And so um, based on those points, we came up with this concept of what if we could take on a really common and, and problematic source of plastic pollution by taking it on upstream, working together with the, the communities that, that are generating this um, because of the lack of infrastructure and understanding, and instead transform into a high value material source that we can then make into positive products that can then in, in turn scale and, and continue to provide a solution for this material. And after scouring what was out there, the material that really stuck to us was this problem of discarded fishing nets. Um, it is, um, in terms of entrapment of marine life, it's four times more harmful than all other forms of ocean plastic pollution combined. Um, and when I was in Chile, which has a very strong presence of not only commercial, but artisanal fishermen, I would literally go and ask around the fishermen, what were you doing with your nets? And to my amazement, the answers were consistently, especially on, on the artisanal small scale level, um, we either would dump it in the ocean or if it was too big of a pile for us to move, we'd light it on fire on the beach and come to find out that is releasing uh, toxic fumes that if you were to inhale directly, it could kill you. And so it's pretty remarkable to see that this is a really um, abundant material that, that could turn over as, as often as a weekly basis that they weren't having a solution for. 
And so with that, um, I brought in my two other partners. Um, David really fit in well with the finance side of it, how to build a business around this. Okay, we got to transform this, not just into another fishing net, but something of higher value so that we can continue to not just cover the cost of this, but, but scale. Um, and then Kevin, who really gave us the insight on, on helping us identify this material because his feedback was consistently, you can't just collect any plastic, especially stuff out in an ocean um, because it degrades, it's mixed. It, and, and Martin is gonna know a lot more about that, I'm sure, it, um, about the challenges of, of, if you don't have a uniform source of plastic to recycle, you're probably not gonna be able to recycle it very effectively. So the benefit of a fishing net is it's almost always made of one uniform type of plastic. So when you find one net, you can be fairly confident that it's all, all one type of plastic material being made in it. So it's great for recycling. And so with that concept, um, we, we were awarded that grant from Startup Chile and we launched um, our, pro, our business Boreo uh, in, in the end of 2013. Uh, where we packed up our things, walked away from our day jobs, and went all in to, to um, funny enough, uh, make our very first product, which we set out to be, I mean, suitable, I guess, for surfers, um, a plastic cruiser skateboard deck. And the, the crazy idea as it was, uh, the numbers made sense. Um, you could transform one kilo, about 2.2 pounds of plastic, into this skateboard deck, that now put some wheels and trucks on it, it's worth over $100. And so that was a really great fit for us from a, a financial standpoint. Um, we did a lot of research and development. I, I also talked to my former professors at Northeastern during this time to get the right insight. Inside, they actually connected us with UMass Lowell where we did a lot of trials to understand the material proper, mechanical properties and structural properties of, of the plastic. They recycled samples of nets for us early on. And in May of, of uh, 2014, 20, 2014, we launched our Kickstarter to, to raise the money for a first production run of skateboards, and we're, on, we're off on the races. And um, it was a great achievement. It was a great accomplishment for us, and, and we, were, we were ticking away as a, as a small business. But what we were continuing to find was as much as we were getting traction, selling a few skateboard, a few thousand skateboards a year through our, our business of, of Boreo, um, we were seeing far more fishing nets um, we were getting traction with turning over year after year where unfortunately at that point we we just had to turn them away because we didn't have the capacity to, to recycle all those nets if again if we're only selling a couple thousand skateboards a year we only need to recycle a couple thousand kilos of, of fishing nets and what we were finding was hundreds if not thousands of tons of fishing nets turning over year after year and so what that's led us to today is a really exciting transformation that we've gone through with our, um, our partner now to this day, um, Patagonia. So Patagonia, the, the outdoor apparel company, I'm sure you guys are recognized for, you're aware of for their um, environmental responsibility. Um, they really set the bar that, in that space and we've always looked up to them starting up Boreo. They have a fund called the Tin Shed Venture Fund, which is that uh, they provide um, small seed investments in early stage startups that are really aligning with Patagonia's values and even maybe have a potential of, of working right alongside Patagonia. And although we started with this idea of just being a, a skateboard company, um, making recycled fishing at skateboards, what, what it eventually led us to is we are now actually a raw material supplier for Patagonia's supply chain. And not only that, uh, they, they, the way Patagonia does things is it's not just for their benefit, it's to change the market. So we have um, now been working with Patagonia's materials development team for the past five years on innovative methods for getting a much higher grade quality and performance out of the recycled fishing net material. We're now branded Net Plus um, to incorporate in not only their product line to, to launch, but then the entire market. And so now instead of doing the couple thousands of tons of year, we've now expanded our operation already to Argentina and Peru, and we're continuing from there. Um, we're on track to do well over a thousand tons a year. And that's really just the beginning. This is a global problem and our mission is to provide a global solution. 
And so um, we've done, show you a couple projects we've done to date. So we've done some early adopters. So Coast to sunglasses, we did a line of sunglasses with them. So these frames are 100% recycled fishing nets um, sourced through our program. Um, and our first collaboration with Patagonia to date is making all the hat rims for their, their, all of their trucker hats. And it's something that you don't really think of, but every single hat that's being made has virgin plastic in the hat room. Nobody really thinks about it. And now through the research development, we went through Patagonia, which by the way, was not easy to get the right fit and, and, and holding the shape and so forth. Um, we now have replaced all of it with our, our recycled fishing net. And we already have a whole list of companies ready to take that on next. Just these simple low hanging fruits to start, but it's, it's already making a big difference in, in our operation and the number of communities and fisheries we have to work with. And that's really where we're at today. Um, I, I'd love to get into this discussion further with Martin now because um, I know there's so much to dive into. Um, but, but to give you a snapshot, we're, we're operating across those three countries. We're headquartered in, in Ventura, California, alongside Patagonia. Um, and our goal is really to just continue to provide this proven solution to every fishery in need. Because um, whether we like it or not, fishing nets meet their end of life. And we have a really awesome solution for them now. That was awesome. <laughs> it's, it's just a great story. I, I actually, I'll start off with just where did the name Boreo come from, actually? I'm great you brought that up because I did not fit that in there. Um, there's a little sunny side story to that. Um, when we just were coming with the concept of, of being a skateboard company, and, and our skateboards are actually in the shape of a, of a fish, a small fish, um, we originally thought of going with minnow skateboards. Minnow is a common small fish. I grew up catching with, with nets and, and you, you find everywhere in, in around New England. Um, and, and we were making these small skateboard decks. So I thought minnow skateboards, that's great. And I ran it by my friends in Chile, living in Chile at the time. And they were saying, uh, -uh. and, and the thing about Chile and Spanish is there's a lot of slang and they were going over with me. They said, remember what, you know, that slang word Mina? And I was like, yeah, and that's like for an attractive girl. And they're like, okay, well, the masculine version of that is Mino, which is very similar sounding to Mino, which is basically an attractive boy. So we were, I was proposing in, in Chilean terms to call ourselves the attractive boy skateboard company. So that wasn't really gonna work. So. We went back to the drawing board and I really went back to the fact that we started this in Chile. We wanted to recognize the country that gave us this opportunity. And I learned about the Mapuche people and, and they have their own language, the native people of Chile. And a really beautiful word we discovered in that journey was the word Boreo, which actually means waves. And so first and foremost, we chose to recognize Chile, the country that gave us this opportunity. But also, it's very symbolic of this crazy mission we've been on. Um, a, a wave starts with this small disturbance on the surface of the ocean. And what we were doing, in a way, was creating this small change in an ocean of plastic. But just as a wave works, with more time and energy, we could, in, in theory, uh, create this great force of change, just like a wave does in, in, in an ocean of plastic pollution. And so that just clicked. Where, where we we just brought it all together one day and we said, yep, that's it, we're Berea. Yeah, and you're certainly making waves now. <laughs> um, no, and I actually, I mean, you you touched on it too, uh, especially the education side of it is is educating people on how to recycle and what to do. And as in our industry, we see it too. It's not that people don't want to do it. It's more often than not, either they're not sure how to, or there's just a missing link in that infrastructure. There's some part of it that doesn't make sense to them either financially or or structurally. Um, how can you talk about how you identified what was needed specifically for the fishing nets uh, and how you set up those missing connections? Yeah, um, so we actually have two kind of streams where we get the nets from. Um, so one is uh, the, the commercial and one is the artisanal. In the case of artisanal, these are low income fishing communities. So these people are very much based on subsistence based living and, and um, are just, you know, trying to get by and then unfortunately in, a, in an industry that is, is getting smaller and smaller because of all of the overfishing activity and the other complications that's been facing 
um, their work. Um, so straightforward, it was about value. And so when we got to connect the material with value by providing a direct compensation for every kilo that they were actively returning to us, they saw value, they saw the incentive and everything clicked. Then the, the surprise to us was when we actually came back and presented the products and, and gave them samples and so forth of what we were making with it, it even went a whole step further where they were getting it as a source of pride that honestly we weren't expecting. And, and it's really helped us take it an even step further of their engagement. Um, so really the, the main things on the artisanal side have been that financial incentive, the making a really simple ease of infrastructure. So having really accessible people to either be available to, to, to manage the nets in each community or a, a really accessible and easy drop off point in each community for the fishermen to directly take it action themselves. In the case of the commercial fisheries, it's a very different approach. They have very comprehensive infrastructure in place to do the management of their nets. And so um, they pre previously were actually having a lot of times to have to pay to send this to a landfill. And so by simply offering them the free service of, of removing their nets was already a good step in the right direction. But what we were showing beyond that was by receiving the nets for free, we were opening ourselves up with a greater budget to do more work. And so in turn, what we did is for every kilo we got from the commercial fisheries, instead of having that, that money we already had allocated to procure the nets from the artisanal fishermen, we instead committed to donating that money to local nonprofits that would then do meaningful environmental programs in their area. And so it was creating a really different value that was in some ways, um, you know, if, if not greater than what we could offer them financially. Uh, because now it wasn't just about, hey, we're recycling our nets and not sending them to the landfill or, or dumping them in the ocean, but we're also um, doing something much greater by creating a positive social impact, all by simply giving these guys, these gringos on the ground, access to our, our trash. And so it became a really big win-win-win for us. And it's been something we've grown where we've, we've generated over 100,000 US dollars over the course of that program in Chile, and now it's already expanded to, to Peru and Argentina. Yeah, uh, I, you, you mentioned that, that at first it was these financial incentives for, the, for these local fishermen. Uh, was that subsidized at first, basically by the funds that you had done and then became profitable afterwards? But when you're saying subsidized by the funds, which funds are you referring to? Like from the, the Chile the, government to start up your business? Oh, gotcha. Very little. Um, those funds were really more for the, the startup costs of equipment, securing a warehouse facility, and, and just getting us up off the ground. Um, what really sustains it is, is when we were able to then transform that material into a high value product, and then that be being fed to then not only cover that cost, but, but allow us to work with a lot more communities and source a lot more material. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about more how the research you had to do to find out how to get such a high value product out of fishing nets? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I can say specifically on the side, you know, we started out with a skateboard, not knowing really much, but again, I have really complimentary partners. I was coming from this life cycle sciences side of, of being on the ground in Chile. So I could really be in getting into that supply chain, lining up all the partners. David was the financial guy. So he was he was coming from working as a financial consultant at Ernst & Young. So he was great as, as seeing the, the business case and, and the business model for us. And then Kevin, as a design engineer, was perfect to do to fill that role of the research development. So he, he did all the CAD work and everything. But really where it started is we simply took um, samples of, of the fishing nets that were found in those communities. We brought them to UMass Lowell. They, they um, got it to pellet and made tensile bars where they got to get the, the, the structural properties of, of the plastic. Um, Kevin then made the CAD model of our, of our skateboard design um, and, and put in those properties to see how, how well it would perform. We then um, also did some reverse engineering of existing plastic cruiser skateboards in the market, did some tensile tests at UMass Lowell on, on those boards to understand how those were performing. And then uh, we did a couple rounds of 3D printing to see how the design would feel and work. 
but eventually it was um, a matter of, of um, getting the, the mold made with our Chilean recycling and manufacturing partner in Santiago and, and actually getting the board um, to, to, to work. And that was uh, what we called the stomp test. Our number one priority was we did not want the board to snap in the middle of it because that would be really make it very quickly quite useless. Um, so there was a lot of trials of, of increasing the ribbing and, and, and other opportunities for reinforcing and, and um, eventually we got to the right fit and, and, um, and, and launched the board. But basically the key step we found was getting those material properties um, from the plastics engineering lab and, and that really helped guide us the rest of the way in, into um, knowing what we're working with and, and how we can work with in the future. And was it very similar for Patagonia as well, or did Patagonia do that research on their side? Um, <clears throat> it was a lot more comprehensive with Patagonia, but it was a similar process. Uh, Patagonia, the, the nice thing about working with Patagonia is once you get through all the hoops of Patagonia's requirements for being their, their material supplier, everyone else is really <laughs> easy. Um, so they have um, standards like red, red list substances. So you have to get like in parts per million, your material tested um, to, to see if there's any traces of, of harmful substances in, in the material. Um, so that was a, a, a big uh, process for us to have to go through. Every single batch of material we supply to them has to go through that. So that was a really big step up for us, you know, making sure all of our quality control was in place. Um, and then beyond that was um, every product had a, its own very specific performance, like the hat brim, which is the first one we started, but we have a whole laundry list from there where not only does the, the product get made and, and they see how it works, but they actually send it to their ambassadors, their professional surfers and rock climbers and runners that go and use it in the field and have to give it the okay of saying, yeah, this, this works just as good, if not better than what was being used before in, in place of this material. Oh, that's a good process. Um, yeah, I'll I mean, that's why it's been five years and we, so far we've launched one hat room, but we've got a lot, a lot more to come. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll get into a little more detail on, on recycling in general. So basically in conventional waste collection, a hauler or recycler makes a profit from buying a material or buying garbage sorting it out, separating the valuable, selling that at a profit. Um, and across the world, this happens in different ways. I mean, in Europe, uh, for example, it tends to force this on the consumers to do the labor, basically separating your plastics into one bin, your paper, your cardboard, your glass, your organics, all into separate bins uh, so that it's all separated. That's what we call source separation, um, which is super efficient if, again, everybody does it. Uh, and then there's some cleanup, mostly automated, to remove those contaminants, um, and then it gets goes to a mill to be reused. In the U.S., the onus was taken off of the consumer, and it's called single stream. So all of that material goes into one bin. So your plastics, paper, cardboard, glass, metals all into one, and then your organics and your garbage into another. And then the facilities that we sell, the one kind of similar to what I have behind me right now, sorts that material then again into its individual components and then it goes to a mill um, to become a new raw commodity basically. Um, and then so the most advanced systems in the U.S. almost have no people working in them as they try to reduce labor but in other areas of the world where labor is cheap a lot of this process is still done by hand. Uh, and as the con technology continues to improve, maybe in the future, the garbage will be mixed in too, and then we'll just take out as much recyclables as possible. I guess my question is, how does Boreo fit into this framework in the supply chain? Like, do you own the plastics from basically the fishermen all the way until you sell it to Patagonia? So even while it's at the, the processing facility and being made into the pellets? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. I, it, it every we have a couple different streams of plastic now that we work with that each of them are, are slightly different but in general um we do um own the material all the way through to selling it um and and that's been what we've done to date um what we do do is we have um entities in each country that the Boreo uh, headquarters the u.s company subcontracts to see through that that separation and preparation process for recycling 
And then that then gets, so they, they actually invoice us in our headquarter company in the United States for that process. In some cases, it's our own entity. In some cases, we, we partner with an existing entity in those countries. And, and then we see it through all the way. And, and what it does is it allows us to get a lot more control over our material. A big thing that we take care in is the traceability of our material so that we have that ability for the, the authenticity and the storytelling part of this. Um, every single source of net we get, um, we track it from the, that fishing community all the way to delivered to final products um, for, for clients like Patagonia. And that's all third party audited by um, uh, the global recycling standard or the recycled claim standard to ensure that it's 100% post-consumer end of life fishing nets that have been recycled. Um, and, but really we're trying to get to a level where we can have the beautiful equipment that you guys sell in our operations. We're slowly getting there, but Nets being such, fishing nets being such a unique material, we've, we've actually had to rely on a lot of manual labor. Um, it was literally just myself and my two other partners uh, doing it all ourselves in the beginning, getting the nets, unloading it by hand, uh, cutting them in down into these manageable panels, um, washing them, letting them dry, visually inspect, cut out any visible debris, and then getting them to our recycling partners where, where they would then mechanically shred, crush, wash, and pelletize the material. And in some ways we're still doing that now, but a lot of those process of cutting and washing and processing, pre-processing the material, we're getting more and more automated. Um, but really uh, when it comes to the, 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 the technology we've, tried many times of, of identifying the different net material types because it's such a huge risk if you get another um, plastic material in, mixed in with, with the, the other materials um, can cause such an impact on, on the quality of the final pellet that we produce. We really um, have just focused on needing still to this day a lot of hands-on work um, and, and manual labor to, to, to have experienced people to see it through. Um, it's getting supported more and more by, by conveyors and, and automated systems, but we still do need to rely on that know-how of an experienced worker that can tell that each piece of net is in fact 100% consistent raw material that we need for this recycling run. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that changing in the, in the upcoming years then, I guess? Um, we're gonna, we are going to in, invest in a lot better equipment to streamline that washing phase, that pre-processing phase, um, all that's, that's going um, more and more streamlined, but I think we still will re rely on a small team of workers um, to do that, that first manual effort um, to, to, so that we can have that know-how that honestly we haven't seen, and maybe we can talk more about that offline, we haven't seen machines capable of doing, which is um, identifying that each panel of net is in fact 100% uniform material. Um, that still to this day has been our, our, um, our approach that we've needed to rely on to get full assurance that, that our material is consistent. Mm. So that also kind of prevents you from using other materials, I'm guessing too. Or do you, or I don't know, is Boreo potentially working on recycling different types of plastics to make into different products? Yeah, we, we get that question all the time. I mean, honestly, um, we'd love to in the future, but we have our hands absolutely full um, with fishing nets. And so what we've, we've consistently felt is we never would have gotten this far if we try to take on too many types of plastic and instead by focusing specifically on a few select um, types of material that are consistently present in, in end of life fishing nets. Uh, it's allowed us to not only um, have a solution and scale that solution for it, but get us this far with these innovative um, solutions with companies like Patagonia as partners. I, if we were just showing them any recycled mixed plastic that we were getting across, I don't think we could have ever made it to to get to this kind of quality standards that we're achieving now no that's that's a very good point it's a, it's funny because my dad talks about this expression it's a dutch expression 
schoenmaker blijft bij je leest, which translates to basically a, shoe a shoemaker stays within his, within his field. So like you, you focus on what you're good at and that'll actually get you farther than trying to do everything all in one go. Yes, uh, that's it. That's it. Maybe I didn't even know it, but it was taking <laughs> on those Dutch roots just, yeah. just from, from the bloodstream. <laughs> um, and I guess, so through that, you're probably definitely, I mean, you told me earlier too, you were focusing on fishing communities and, and you would uh, expanded into Argentina and Peru. Um, I mean, yeah, 80% of the plastic pollution comes from about 20 of the countries. And I mean, one third of the plastic in the ocean comes from China and Indonesia. Um, are there specific countries you're looking at next uh, and, and why? Um, and what, what makes those your big next targets? Yeah, I mean, Asia is always the one that we eventually want to get to, um, specifically um, Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines. Um, these, are, these are places where it's, it's really um, a, a significant opportunity there to work. Um, Western Africa is another place um, that we've continued to get feedback on um, a strong presence there and very little to, if any, regulation in, in managing these, this, this waste that's generated. Um, but, but right now, I mean, it, it's just inherent um, that we're, we're working already in our own backyard in, in California, um, where we've, there's a program that the California um, Fisheries and Wildlife Program set up called the, the Drift Gill Net Buyback Program. So Drift Gill Nets are really awful um, fishing practice. It's basically, you have this huge net um, that's absolutely designed to trap marine life that people would previously just leave in the ocean. And when it got filled up, they would have satellite trackers to go collect it. And that's now been banned in California, that fishing practice. And so they had a program to buy back all the nets the grip, drip gill nets from the fishermen, and we've now been um, recognized as, an, as a partner to, to take all those nets to be incorporated into our program. So we're already collecting nets in California. Um, Mexico is just south. So our, our hope is in the next, um, I would say, two years, would, uh, since we're already in California, to set up a, a, an operation, a smaller operation there, so that we can start accepting nets in North America. Um, but really the big one would then be to see about um, um, Asia and, and getting over there. But it, we're really taking it step by step. I mean, honestly, we still, we just launched in, in Argentina and Peru um, a year, year and a half ago. And, and there's just so much more opportunity to expand there. Um, so we're really focused on that in the near term. I mean, I mean, Peru has the largest fishing port by catch in the world. It's, honestly breathtaking to see the number of boats in that port and you can literally see the nets like like pouring out into the streets where where they're not you know they're trying to find you know you have these really amazing resourceful people on the ground um you know making it into fencing for for chicken coops and and um you know very various reuses but to have something consistently um having an end of life solution is something we're really working together with the with the fisheries with the communities and with the peruvian government and we've got a lot of work still ahead of us to to get that accomplished yeah i, I can imagine i mean i know especially with what we're dealing with here is everybody in the u.s wants to use less and less labor and like you were saying that that first step of the process on getting those nets clean is pretty labor intensive uh, so i can imagine california would be a tough one i guess in those yeah. areas through where you are right now, what what are the biggest challenges for you in terms of growing Boreo there? I mean, obviously the immediate one um, has been COVID. Of course. Obviously. <laughs> um, I, we left um, Chile in last February thinking, you know, I, I basically go every other month to go visit our operation in each country. And um, leaving at that point just had a good solid run see you guys back in a couple months you know obviously we have the day-to-day -day team running the operation um and and then it went 10 months went by where we weren't able to travel back there again they shut the borders down chile took it extremely seriously as they should 
um, but it, it eliminated our ability where we, we literally had three months last year where people weren't even able to show up to work and, and do any business at all. Uh, we, we said we were going to stick to paying everyone's salaries and, and get through this. And, and thankfully, again, with, with the business, the sales increasing through the, the raw material supply, we're, we're growing with Patagonia. We could afford to do that. And, and actually, the return has been really positive for us. We have an even more committed team on the ground in each country. And uh, I just actually got back um, about a week and a half ago, and my partners are there now. Like basically, as soon as they lifted the the travel ban, uh, we went, and uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, and but the more more inherent thing is is being safe, and the priority number one is our workers and making sure um, traveling to work, operating in a, in a an environment. Granted, it's a big open warehouse, but but with multiple people coming from from you know different backgrounds, um, making sure everyone's safe and and. Thankfully, knock on wood, everyone has been safe um, so far, uh, but, it, but it's, it's an ongoing challenge for us. Beyond that, it's, it's, um, it's gonna be about uh, really just buttoning everything up now and, and getting the quality control secure, um, the, the operation streamlined, and getting us to really solidify our, our source of material. And because they're getting to such substantial volumes, you know, before when we needed, you know, 10, 50, 100 tons a year, it was easy to pull that out of, you know, a, a country like Chile, where they were easily turning over 600 tons a year. But now when you need to be confident that you have to get, you know, 500 tons a year for each facility, at least, um, and we're expanding to more and more of these locations, um, it, it, it takes a lot more work to, to secure that. So we've been um, doing a lot of research and understanding where are the streams of plastics going, of the fishing nets going. And it's actually kind of frustrating to see because a lot of it, although they're saying, oh, it's being repurposed and and into a secondhand market, it's being repurposed for a single use, which almost always ends up getting dumped afterwards. So we're trying to dig into that deeper and the government's been really positive uh, with working with us on that so that we can um, create create a more buttoned up and more high accountability for this material so that yes it might have a one reuse but but at the end of the day it's going to be responsible uh, when it meets its end of life it's going to be responsibly managed and and so we're doing a lot with end of life certification and, and recognition of, of the responsible management and disposal of the material that's being accredited through our our, our operation and, and then the other big one is, is getting to more artisanal communities. Um, we've, we've had to rely on the large volumes we can get from commercial fisheries to solidify the supply chain, but there's still so many more small scale artisanal communities that from a business standpoint might not be so cost effective to work in because you, know, you can go to one commercial fishery and get 30 tons of nets where one artisanal community that takes twice as long to get to um, could maybe give you 500 kilos a year. And, it, but the principle is that we know that those communities are the most vulnerable to discarding the nets. And so we're really working on finding more and more ways to work with them and, and, and more ways to expand that solution to more, more communities. And so I would say those are probably the big ones we're, we're facing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nice transition into into the circular economy. I mean, that you had mentioned too, which is kind of the the newest. I don't want to call it a buzzword, but the kind of getting there in the recycling industry as a whole. I mean, the EU is already setting goals and creating a strategy and an action plan to work towards it. Um, and for those on the call who aren't sure what it is, the circular economy is right now like a traditional linear economy is where you make a product from a raw material, you use it, and then you dispose of it. And that's kind of what you were talking about there. Um, and the, in the circular economy, basically you keep the resources, use it for as long as possible, extract the maximum value whilst in use, and then recover and regenerate whatever you can from that. And the goal is to have no waste from it. Um, and that can be through recycling or through other means. Um, and I mean, in a true circular economy, there's no virgin material going in and there's also no waste going out. Um, that's a very lofty goal, obviously, especially in the short term. 
but it's companies like Patagonia that are making a difference because they're, they, they want to make that change. And again, it's the commercial fisheries. It's easy to work with them. It's, it's those artisanal ones that don't necessarily understand the benefit of having that circular economy to them at least. Um, but I, I do see it in our industry too. I mean, companies like Procter and Gamble and Unilever, they used to be just making sure that their shampoo bottles, their Tide containers, their Axe uh, spray cans were recyclable, but now they're actually coming to our test facility and making sure that, um, or they're actually making their products out of recycled products, um, out of recycled material. And that's why HDPE is much more expensive now in the global market is because that's where the, that demand is coming from. Um, how can we get more companies to focus on that, I guess? How can we get more impact? I mean, it's on one side, again, it's, it's idealistic, but, but the, the whole every dollar is a vote, like people demonstrating that, that they're, they expect this of businesses and, and will drive their dollars to them and will certainly justify it. But honestly, uh, I think the reality is, is we need more um, enforcement from a government level. Um, simple things that we're working on in Chile are um, when we when nets cross borders um, from let's say nets are coming in from Peru from Chile they're now going to require um, that they, they they need to have that address of the delivery location to be a certified um, end of life disposal site for that material so it's not just going to some you know, Jose's backyard that's going to rig it up to try to, you know, do something that might not be so responsible. Um, the step further where you're seeing, and sorry, I'm speaking very specifically of fishing nets, but that's my, my area, obviously. Um, the, the most progressive I've seen is, is, is countries like Panama, where every single time uh, a fisherman in Panama wants to buy a new fishing net, he has to have a certificate showing the proper disposal of his old fishing net. And I really think that's simply where it needs to get to. Um, beyond that, uh, it, it, it's, it, it sounds idealistic now to say like there should be no more virgin plastic going in and so forth. And, and honestly, the number of new petrochemical plants that are being made and the projections, it's all really staggering to see how that would ever be possible. But if we ever want to get over this crisis we're having with, with plastic pollution, that is in fact what I believe we need to get to. It's insane how many, not just new plastic products are being made, but how much of it uh, is actually capable of being recycled again. And I mean, you'll, you, I'm sure Martin knows that way more than me, uh, working with a, a variety of plastics, but that should just simply not be allowed anymore. Every, like the benefit of saying, hey, this is a recyclable product, meaning that at its end of life, you can actually recycle it. That should be inherent in every plastic product that exists today. How can you ever dare to make something that like a water bottle or what have you, I mean, granted water bottles are recyclable, um, that you can use for a moment and a matter of seconds that can then last hundreds of years um, to, to break down again. So it just doesn't make any sense. So I do believe that driving that circular economy, um, definitely on an industry level, so there's value for the, these companies to pivot because that's the fastest way for them to move. But really, I think it's going to have to be government driving it to, um, to get it mandated across all levels. Yeah, no, and, and I know specifically in Japan actually does the same kind of thing. Let's take refrigerators, for example. They actually, refrigerators are more expensive in Japan because as you buy it, you also buy basically what happens to it afterwards. They, it goes to a specific factory who literally has workers taking off the doors, taking out the plastic, taking out the metals, and, and basically breaking it all down to recycle each individual component. But that's built into the price of buying that refrigerator in the first place. So it's actually the consumer who, who holds that um, or who, who buys that into it. So it's kind of like the same as you're saying, the fishermen in Panama, which is great to hear in Panama too, because in Panama specifically, um, I know they have a huge landfill problem right now. They, their landfills are basically totally full and they, they, need, they need better solutions for recycling what they have. Um, so yeah, I mean, the circular economy, it's, it, is a, it is a lofty goal. We'll, we'll see if we can, we can get there. Um, do you, 
I, I would, this is transitioning a little bit, but did, is there anybody you modeled or is there some business that you modeled Boreo off of, or was this, is this just your idea a hundred percent or is there a mentor you look up to? I mean, as a business, Patagonia was definitely a, a guiding light of, of evidence that, that this works, you know, having your values in the forefront of what you're setting out to achieve your mission um, was was something to, to give us confidence that th this space exists. But beyond that, um, I've had a great mentor um, being Greg Norris uh, from from the um, Harvard School of Public Health, um, but he's also behind the in uh, International Institute for International Living Futures Institute, which founded um, the Living Product Challenge. And this whole concept <clears throat> that I wholly believe in for making products and, and operating business uh, is another really great way that I think we can solve a lot of problems we're facing. But again, it's a huge idealistic challenge is they actually um, typically what, an, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the term eco label, but typically it's an environmental label you put on a product to accredit for its environmental benefits. Um, are, are usually doing something that is showing that this product is causing less harm to the environment. And what uh, the Living Product Challenge and what Greg Norris created with the concept was the hand printer, where you actually recognize instead of the footprint and a reduced footprint being your impact on the environment, an actual hand print, we're actually creating things that have a regenerative effect. And that's where you're, by doing this product, by producing this material or, or, or having this operation, by having this building exist, you're actually doing more benefit than harm and you're creating a net positive impact. And ultimately that's what I'm setting out to try to achieve with our material is we actually did achieve living product challenge recognition for our hand printer impact early on. But now that we've scaled um, we had to renew that process, which we're going through right now. And ultimately, what we want to try to achieve is not like, hey, our product is causing less harm to the environment. But actually, when you add everything up, when you add up the, the unavoidable footprint of, of the energy consumption, water consumed, and so forth to produce our material, when you factor in the benefit of the community projects we're doing on the ground and the other investments we're doing, um, for the environment and communities, we actually are capable of creating a net positive impact with our material. And that, that's really the bigger, deeper vision that I, I'm trying to get to with Boreo that I've really tried to embrace all along with, with what we've been doing. That's great. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience here. Uh, sure. Uh, is so outside of purchasing items like sunglasses, skateboards, and apparel from, from companies like Patagonia, um, that responsibly source their materials, how can individuals like us help in your mission? And do you partner with nonprofits that can be donated to? Yes. Um, so first answer the first part of it as an individual level. I mean, it is, it is back to the every dollar is a vote and, and your own actions um, and, and educating yourself on these issues and, and, and seeing whatever environment you're in on a local level, what you can do. Um, that being said, I do think there are those, those three points earlier about education, infrastructure, behavior change. Those need to be driven by bigger entities. And so um, by, by finding those organizations and supporting them and working with them, whether it be a business that's trying to do good or a nonprofit, um, that, that will be serving a, the greater good uh, that's driving the cause and, and creating real change. Organizations we work with, like um, the Five Gyres Institute, that's really shed a light on this problem of plastic pollution in the ocean. They're, they're doing new studies every year annually, and, and um, that's groundbreaking work. Um, so supporting them in that space, also with legislation efforts as well. Um, other groups who work with um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition, Surf Rider Foundation, um, Sustainable Coastlines, um, they're all great organizations in, in, on, a, in, in, on a national level in the United States we work with. Other NGOs we work with on more of a grassroots level are um, the uh, World Wildlife Fund, Chile and Peru, we partner with them directly. Smaller NGOs, we in each region we work with, um, like, I mean, fun, these are all very very small groups, like like um, Fundación El Arbol and, and um, 
and uh, gosh, I'm, I'm losing track, but I, I can share them afterwards. Um, and then uh, on the specific level of, of um, fishing gear is the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. So they're now under the Ocean Conservancy. I'm actually a member of their um, expert advisory committee. And what it's been great for, for us is, is it's an umbrella organization. So everybody in the world, divers that are diving for ghost gear, um, fisheries that are trying to step up their protocols, governments that are wanting to do more about preventing ghost gear to other recyclers like us. Um, it's an umbrella organization where we're all working together under a common mission to create solutions for that. So they're, they're the ones really spearheading that space and would also be a really great group to, to support if, if you, you're looking to help out in this, in this area. That's really good. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, we, we see it in our industry too, especially the big one is, is like the plastic grocery bags. I mean, they say that they're recyclable, like they have a little symbol on them that they are, but if you get a little more educated on them, basically they just tie up the systems that recycle them they're at the end if you do manage to sort them out um they're worth very very little they're not actually sustainably able to be sold and recycled into a new product because they're they're just too flimsy um yeah. and so it it is it's interesting to see see especially a country like the u.s where there are lobbyists in washington who are pushing to have more and more of these plastics because they're so cheap to make and be able to 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 carry so many groceries but um but that's 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 a whole separate issue uh all so there's a couple more questions so who are the top contributors to the ocean plastic pollution and uh and do those responsible or and are those sorry and basically, do they have the law? Do laws exist in those countries, uh, like a net disposal certificates and that kind of thing exist? Um, and I don't know if you know. I I know I did a little bit of research before. I know there's basically I said I mentioned it's 80 percent of the plastic in the ocean is 20 countries, including the U.S., Indonesia, and China are big ones. But these are again just plastic in general, not necessarily fishing nets. I'm not sure if you know any more. Yeah, there's. There's a couple of different ways to look at it. It's it's it, it's unfortunately not um, very straightforward. Um, you can look at it as as from an international. There's a lot of reports released on international corporations where they highlight companies like Coca-Cola that are some of the biggest ones um, contributing to plastic pollution worldwide. Um, then on a country um, country by country level, um, there there is as you said that list of 20 countries that are doing uh, work in this. I actually got to attend a, a APEC summit in Taiwan last year, and it was basically um, a lot of environmental ministries that are still just trying to get their head around this problem. Um, but then it's, it's not even that simple because then there's a lot of stuff around um, countries like the United States that are uh, exporting their waste to these third world countries, and then suddenly it's their burden. So where does the responsibility fall in there? Um, and there's been some really interesting changes to that, um, such as China banned the import of plastic waste, and now it's being shuff shuffled around um, South Southeast Asia. So once they did it, because they were getting containers and containers of waste every day, suddenly uh, they they stopped allowing it to come in. Then, then it just suddenly jumped over where Thailand was completely backed up with shipping containers of, of plastic trash. And, and so there's a lot of layers to consider with it. But again, I think there's some great efforts being done um, in Chile, for example, uh, where there's things happening like the Extended Producer Responsibility Act that's already been approved and it's taking in place where they've identified key categories of, of harmful weight and problematic waste streams and now the industries that, similar to the refrigerators in, in Japan, the industries that are introducing that plastic waste into the economy are now held accountable for quotas for uh, funding the responsible removal of that equal amount of waste um, for that product category. And so there are really interesting and progressive things happening. Um, it just gets more and more complicated as it gets pushed down the line because that's easy to achieve even in Chile for like fancy municipalities that have big budgets for waste management infrastructure. 
But then when you get to these poor communities, it, it's, it's a huge burden where people don't even want to touch it because it, it requires so much extra work to, to accomplish anything. And so, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of great reports out there. Again, Five Jars, I think, would be a great group to, to check out. They, they publish and share a lot of information in, in this space. Same with thing with Plastic Pollution Coalition. Yeah. Yeah, what you mentioned about China specifically turn, uh, upturned the U.S. recycling market entirely because most of the U.S. plastics and especially their paper, which is the U.S.'s largest export by volume, is actually recycled paper, was all mm -hmm. going to China. And when China shut its doors, it flooded the rest of Southeast Asia, basically, with, with all of this, this product, and it, and it was too much for them to handle. Um, which has probably also been worse for our oceans because it's it's those poorer countries that tend to let it just go away. Yeah. Places yeah. where it go away too. Um, there's there's actually another question here that um, we're, he's sure we know about the ocean cleanup initiative and could some of those plastic wastes be added to what you're collecting? Because I I know about the the big. Uh, garbage islands out there there's like five of them and that one big one in the pacific ocean that's like twice the size of texas i've how are you collecting fishing nets that are out there already and just floating around or um, yeah we we get that question a lot um again going back to the original research we found on on this issue and and now with seven years of experience um we can definitely say it is not practical at all um, and realistic, and, and you can expand more on the ability to, to sort and recycle um, plastic, a mix of plastics. Um, we, from a, we, we do work and we have supported previously diving groups that, that volunteer to do dives to remove um, ghost gear. Um, and we're obviously an active member of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative that does a lot of groups that work in that space. But realistically, from a cost standpoint, um, when you look at something like an operation that's going to be collecting plastic in the ocean, there was, a, there was an, and I apologize if this isn't up to date, but the study we saw early on and the financial feasibility of that, you were talk, it was coming out to somewhere around seven to eight dollars um, per pound, uh, or sorry, per pound or per kilo, it really doesn't make a difference either way, that's an insane amount of money is the cost of sourcing that material. If you were to go to a, a coastal community that was really vulnerable when it came to plastic pollution, offered them a third of that amount of money for collecting the plastic there before it got there, you're not only gonna get way more consistent and, and cleaner and, and less degraded plastic, but you're gonna create so many more income opportunities for local people and, and, and stop it from ever getting there in the first place because this stuff continues to break down um, you've got photo degradation from the sun where you're going to just simply lose the, the structural mechanical properties of the plastic so you can't even rely on it. And again, the mix of plastics you're going to find out there is going to be pretty much close to impossible to effectively and consistently recycle. Um, that being said, we need every solution we possibly can, can wrangle up out there for this, this problem because it is insanely immense. I mean, we're talking about every minute, a, a, an entire dump truck of plastic backing up and dumping plastic. Um, that's the equivalent we're facing right now going into the ocean. And so I think it's great that they've called awesome attention to this. One way or another, they're, they're pulling plastic out of the ocean. So I think that's, that's beautiful. And uh, the only side of it we just don't want people to feel like is, oh, there's a machine out there taking it out. So I no longer have to worry and take responsibility with my plastic trash because the magic machine's gonna collect it and recycle it for me anyways. That's yeah. not the case. Um, they're, they're doing great things and they've done great, great effort and they're touchy and, and that's rad. And, but, um, but we still have a lot more to do and opportunity to, to solve this. No, I think that's a, definitely a key point is that stopping at the source is not only more profitable, but it's better in the long run. And yes, of course, we need to clean up everything that's out there and try and get as much out of it as we can, but it is indeed more difficult. And we see that on our end too. I mean, the cleaner the product is when it goes into one of our systems, the cleaner it's going to come out. And when you're putting in something that's been floating in the ocean for 10 years or whatever, um, it's just you're not going to get as much out of it. 
Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, even uh, just getting fishing nets from communities, I can say firsthand, it is not easy to always ensure you have a consistent supply. So I have no clue, honestly, how you could expect to get consistent supply of just scooping plastic of from whatever God knows source out of the ocean and, and trying to recycle into something again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah, because that's that's the exact point is, uh, is all of our customers stay in business because they have consistent supply and consistent demand on what they recycle. And that's exactly what you're talking about there is if you don't have that, then you're not going to have something sustainable. Um, there's there's one uh, little little knockoff question that came in early. Uh, why are your sunglasses so expensive? Ah, yeah, <laughs> we get that question a lot. I mean, so from I mean, for, for us, we no longer sell the, the products uh, directly. We have partnering companies. So in the case of the sunglasses, Costa is our partner. Um, and if you actually look at Costa's market price, we're actually below, pretty well below average. Um, they usually come in around like two, 250 and ours are, are under that. Um, so it actually is pretty reasonable and really the cost is in ours. It's, it's their lenses. They're, they make these world-class lenses um, that are glass and, and, and designed specifically for water sports that, I mean, I will have to say like when you go on the water with them, you, you don't want to wear anything else again. It's incredible. Um, so really the cost is in that. It's not our, our material. Um, it's, it's that that um, that price point that they work on and, and they work really hard to make a really high quality product. That was something we really focused on in the beginning is we saw before us um, and still continuing, like there's a lot of space for, you know, recycled plastic trash bins and, and pencil cups and very simple things. And they're saying, oh, that's nice to recycle plastic. But what we really want to do is make plastic sexy. And that's all about having it be in really high quality products that are appealing and, and people can appreciate. And so working with partners like Costa, um, yes, they do have a high price point, but it's because they work so hard to make a high quality product, which now fortunately is made with our plastic. Nice. Um, so that's it for the questions from the audience, at least for right now, uh, unless anybody else has any coming in. Um, I do think one of the biggest things to wrap up with is education, I think. It is really just, uh, educating one people in the harm that they're actually doing to the environment uh, and the harm that these plastics can cause um, but also educating them in the right ways to prevent that and the the uh, giving them the options uh, and having them understand that um, like for example in our industry is everybody thought plastic bags were recyclable and they were just throwing them in the recycling and they weren't educated on the fact that that actually does more harm than good um, so is there anything in particular that you want to share along with education and how you've tackled that? I mean, it, again, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really going to take a, a, a combined effort here. So um, everyone, if, if you feel driven in this, I mean, we're, we're doing one small piece of a really huge puzzle that needs to get completed in order, order for us to take on. So if it, it, it can take some self-reflection and in, in seeing what your every day is like to see where you could fit in opportunities for doing more. And, and there's plenty of resources out there, thanks to the internet, that, that can educate you and get you up to speed. And it's, <clears throat> it's really a case by case basis, but overall it's, it's looking at your own actions and seeing where it can go further. And then being realistic to that, that's not the end of it. it, it then going beyond that and supporting the greater causes that are creating the greater shifts and and um, and helping cheering them on to get it done. Yeah, yeah. because I know that the, the more you know, the more you're capable of making those good decisions in, buying, in the products that you buy um, and what you do with them when they reach their end of their life. Um, and that's why I think webinars like this are good because if nothing else, it's just increasing our collective knowledge and giving us all more ideas on how we can help. Um, Absolutely. Is there anything else you want to add? Because I think that's it on my end. No, I, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity. I, I just, I echo again a lot, of, like so much of my journey is thanks to um, the education experiences I got at Northeastern. Um, I didn't even get to top to mention, I put so much emphasis on the program and in Chile, but I actually was also alongside that 
in, in Northeastern's idea program, um, which is the, the Northeastern University startup incubator um, that gave us uh, the funds to put a down payment on our mold of our first skateboard and, and helped another round of funding to launch uh, our Kickstarter campaign. And that was a huge help for us and, and some of those, those mentors are, are still with us to this day um, in different capacities, helping us um, with the program. So um, definitely we'll be forever grateful for Northeastern University. Likewise here. I mean, I had, I, it was funny to read your, your bio before and your talking points because I had the same kind of uh, flow. It, through the co-op program, the experiential learning from Northeastern, it got to me to where I am today. Um, and having types of discussions like this. So I'm really grateful to, uh, to be involved still. Agreed. <laughs> well, this is fantastic. We all learn a lot today. And thank you guys so much for such a wonderful, wonderful presentation and story, your stories are um, amazing. Well, thank you everyone for coming. If you would like to see the, um, the recording of this um, program, please email me directly. My email you will see on my um, screen um, under my uh, image. And um, yeah, so we hope to get the programs like this more and more and educate our public even through uh, these small talks. Well, thank you so much guys. And uh, thank you everyone who attended and we're looking forward to see you again. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Be safe. Bye.